right. Oh, I just love those. That last one always gets me, you know. Because <laughs> my chains are gone. I've been set free. That's too bad. I'm sorry. But he is the only way that we have comfort. Um, <laughs> we're gonna have uh, we're we're gonna have uh, communion this morning. So if we go to First Corinthians, eleven twenty four. Are you familiar with the Hebrew marriage? What what how that is all works out. If you're not, I'm going to explain it a little bit here because it's something that's just intriguing to me. So a Hebrew marriage, they don't court, they don't have, they don't date. The the parents usually decide who's getting married. And but you know the, the kids may have some part in that too. But what it is is they the 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 father of the groom, the groom, pays a dowry to the bride's father. Then that means that they are betrothed. So they would, the, the, the two that were going to be married would then drink wine. And that seals the deal. They, that means they choose to be married. At that point, they're married. Okay, they are what's called betrothed. Okay, the marriage is an extended period of time. Okay, so when they drink the wine, then they are married in all intents and purposes. Now, the, the groom will say, now I go and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he would go back to his father's house and he would prepare the place where they would live and they would just build another addition on to the house that they grew up that he grew up in that the father has and that the, the families stayed together like that so he would go to his father's house and prepare a place for them and when the father decided that the place was good enough the place was ready to go he would say go get your bride so that day he would prepare for his bride to be there so he'd get the the you know the Everything the, that they would need to survive for seven days because they would go into this place for seven days. The, the groom and the bride would go here and they would consummate the marriage. They would not come out for seven days. This was so he would prepare that and it'd take him all day to do that. And then he'd go get his friends. Guess what? Dad said, it's time to go get my bride. So he would say, they would say, okay, as soon as we get off, they get off about six, seven o'clock at night. So then the groom and all his buddies would go get the bride, and they called them. They called it stealing the bride. They would go get the bride at night, and they would snatch her away and take her to his house because it was ready. And the bride, this whole time, had to be watching and waiting and ready with her lamp of oil filled with oil, and so she had to be watching and waiting, ready for the bridegroom to come at any moment. Does that sound familiar to any of us? Okay. Now, what what I want to point out here, though, is in the very beginning, when he promises himself to the bride, they take a cup of wine and they drink it together, and it's called communion. They now commune together. They are married in the eyes of God. See, at that point in time, this, this is what Mary did with Joseph. Remember, Joseph said he was going to put her away. He was going to divorce because they had already done this. And then he finds out that she's pregnant with Jesus. And then the angel says, don't worry about it. It's, it's, she didn't cheat on you. This is of God. And so he didn't put her away. But they were married. They just did not consummate the marriage yet. So that's what's important about this. They drank the wine. They communed together, and that was the promise that he's coming to get his bride. Well, that Last Supper that we celebrate when we do communion is 
Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. In other words, I'm coming for you. Hang on tight. Be watchful and be waiting. Because when the father says, it's time to go get your bride, I'm coming for you. And you're my bride. So when we take this cup and we drink, drink this cup, it's a cup of communion between Jesus, the bridegroom, and the church, the bride. And so we 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 um, we enter into this covenant with God that hey we're watching and we're waiting and we're doing this to remember what He did for us on the cross, what He did to con- to uh, promise to us the bride He's coming for us, and so that's what communion is, and so. In verse 24 of chapter 11 in 1 Corinthians says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes he's going to come for his bride one day and he's going to take us to heaven and we're going to have seven years of a marriage supper see they would do seven days and god just makes everything a lot bigger and he's going to do it for seven years so while this earth is going through hell called the tribulation period we're going to be going through a supper we're going to go through a feast we're going to be celebrating our marriage with the lamb and it's a spiritual marriage it's not a physical marriage it's a spiritual marriage and that's what our physical marriages point towards is the marriage that god will have with us through jesus christ therefore whoever eats this bread and drinks the cup of the lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the lord But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. Now, that could mean a couple things. Number one, this I always say that this is a time where we can reflect on our lives and we can get right with God. Another thing is, does your body belong to Christ? If your body does not belong to Christ, then do not drink this because you will drink judgment on yourself. This is only for the bride of Christ. This is an agreement that you make with Jesus until he comes. So if you are a Christian, if you are a Christ follower, then you are able to take this bread and take this cup and drink it and commune with him to remember when he comes for us. And that's what it's for. Let's go ahead and bow our heads right now. Father, we just, we uh, we thank you for your communion. We ask that you would uh, commune with us today. <laughs> Help us to, to see our faults and we would confess them to you, Lord. Father, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of all the things that we've done that displeases you and we miss the mark. We miss your perfect will for our lives. Lord, we ask that you would, Uh, forgive us and we know that when you do forgive us our sin is as far as the east is from the west and you remember it no more and it's gone from our lives and we can know that you have forgiven us once and for all father you have taken care of our sins past present and future lord we just we we just want you to bless this communion that we will have here with you this morning and father we pray for For those who are sick that can't be here today, we pray for Doug's aunt, Lord, that uh, you would uh, help her out, heal her, and uh, be with her. And we pray for others that aren't here that um, for whatever reason that you would just lift them up, Lord, and that they would follow you and remember that you are their God and that you are what is most important. You're the reason we get here, gather here today, and we're here because of you. Father, fill this place with your spirit overflowing. Fill this place and open our spiritual ears that we might hear what you would have to say. And, 
Let not my mouth speak my words, but your words, Father. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you are a Christ follower, then come on up and take of the communion. Say hi. Hi to everybody. Hi. She got help me preach. She looks just like Jay. <laughs> little mini me, Jade. So Mary's going to come up here and she's got a word to say um, about some things that have uh, processed in her life and some blessings. So, Mary, come on up here. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. It's weird to be up here for me. It's weird to be back in this church that I love so much and haven't been able to be here in almost two years, except for rare occasions. I've been sick. I'm not sure if you all knew that. But some people did. And I've been down a long road that God called me on. Lots of valleys. 
But God gave me mountain experience, and I want to share it with all of you because it is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Don't mind me if I start crying. It's just too wonderful for me sometimes to think about. <clears throat> for the past two years, I've had trouble breathing. I've been asthmatic, get asthmatic bronchitis every fall. So to me, it was a normal thing. I didn't pay much attention, silly me. So saw the doctors, they suggested oxygen, got on oxygen, did everything the doctors told me. Plus I'm adding herbs and stuff that, you know, God has shown me work before and stuff like that. But my health wasn't getting any better. In fact, it was getting weirder. I went out and um, contacted a few other doctors, tried a new diet, tried everything I could think of, praying for, Lord, Lord give me an idea, a suggestion, what should I do? One time, I brought it with you, with me. This is my medical watch. It's the one that actually showed me what my problem was. The doctors couldn't get it right. I've been through five of them. They didn't know what was going on, but this thing's got a thing called an ECG. It does electrocardiogram on your heart. It showed me I had irregular heart rhythms. New thing for me. So I go to the doctor. It says, my watch says, ECG says, my heart's going bad. They hooked me up. They tested me out. Sure enough, it was having some trouble. But they were saying, everything's going to be okay. I didn't feel okay. Beginning of this month, I almost died. They didn't treat it. They didn't do anything about it. So I'm like, Lord, if you want me to go now, I'm fine with that. I just want to be with you. But there's so much more I could do. I just, and there's so much you had me learn, and I don't want to just waste it and take it with me. I want to be able to share it with people. I want to be a witness. I want to come with other souls with me. And I was crying about this to the Lord. And finally came to, I had a doctor's appointment to go and see my regular care doctor. And I was wondering if I was going to make it because I had three more days to go. Tried to call, tried to do anything, but I wanted to avoid the ER in any way, shape, or form. Period. I wasn't going there. I was like, Lord, if you want me to get, my, get to this doctor because he's the one you picked for me, you got to sustain me. I have nothing else to lean on but you guys. And he got me there. He got me there. I walked into the room. They couldn't get my pulse ox on any of my fingertips. My, my nails are actually turning slightly ashen. I didn't think they would, but they got it off of the watch. I know this is an official medical thing, but it gives you a pretty good ballpark what you're dealing with. So we got my pulse. He's like, Barry, I'm worried about you. Really need to go. I want to call an ambulance right now. And this doctor is one who has earned my trust. He's also a fellow believer. Thank the Lord. He says, I said, my friend's with me. He can drive me right down to the hospital because I wasn't driving. That's why I haven't been here. I didn't trust myself to drive without passing out. I didn't trust. I wasn't going to barrel my truck into somebody and kill somebody with it either. So I watched you all. Almost every Sunday, if I missed it that day or I slept too late, I watched it as soon as I could, almost every sermon. I've been enjoying this series, by the way, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so I get to the doctor, I would get to the hospital, they take me in, and when I left my doctor's office, my pulse rate was 42. That wasn't too, too bad. By the time my friend got me to the hospital, I mean, it was bad, but it wasn't dead yet. I get to the hospital, it's like 32. They come in and they do an ECG on me and they put all these wires and sticky tapes everywhere. It's crazy. And by the time they called the cardiologist in on his day off, it was down to 22. And I'm still talking. I'm still witnessing. I'm witnessing to the guy who's taking measurements of my heart chambers. I'm witnessing to the doctors. They're all saying, I ever hear him out in the hall. How is she not dead yet? <laughs> and I said, it's simple. God's too stubborn to let me go. I'm not done yet. Whatever it is, I'm not done yet. Hallelujah. I'm not done yet. You know, I was happy about that. I was like, they're going to fix me. I'm going to walk out of here because God's not done with me. Awesome. We're not, we're not over yet, you know? Sure enough, they wheeled me into surgery. I was home by 9 p.m. I walked in at like 9 a.m. to my doctor's office, and I was back home in bed at 9 p.m. with a pacemaker. And I have a little buddy to keep me going. It'll never get too low, but that didn't say it wasn't going to get too high. That happens the next week. 
So that's what I come flying in here. I saw the sermon on the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years. And Dustin said right after, I said, why is it we don't go to God first? And I heard in the back of my head, almost clear as day, although nobody else heard it because I knew God would say, get up off your ass, go now. <laughs> okay, now I'm dealing with AFib, by the way, but I didn't know that yet. I'm feeling my heart flutter. It's about 150 my pulse right now. And I was like, Lord, you want me to get in that car? You're going to have to settle my heart down because I'm not killing anybody trying to get to the church. You can heal me here. I don't have to go if I don't need to, right? He's like, go. And I was like, okay. Got my keys, jumped in the truck, boogied my butt up here. Got here just in time as you all were letting out. I said, like, Dustin, you need to pray for me. I need a miracle. God told me to get up off my butt and get here now. I didn't even hear the rest of the sermon until later that night. <laughs> but it was awesome. And um, he prayed over me. I had the doctor's appointment the very next day. And I was like, Lord, this is wacky. The meds they gave me aren't working. I'm going to hang in there. Get, you know. So we get in there. I get into, um, we prayed for a miracle. However God wanted to do it, whether you use doctors or not, it didn't matter. We prayed for a miracle. Well, God was gracious enough to grant that miracle because I walk in there Monday morning, see Jason, Dr. Caswell, my doctor, and um, he says, I can fix you up in 20 minutes. And I was like, you must know God because nobody's been able to fix this in two weeks. You know? <laughs> he says, actually, I do. Let's pray about this. And I said, all right, I'm bored. So we prayed over it. He pulled out an IV, put a couple things in there. Something to do with calcium blocker or something like that to get my heart to slow down. Within 10 minutes, my heart went from 150 beats a minute to 135. Another 10 minutes, I was down to 100. 100, 100, 10. He says, within five more minutes, five to 10 more minutes after you walk out this door, because you're done, you're fine. I know you're going to be good. And I was like, okay. And I was like, is he right, Lord? You know, because we can make mistakes. He doesn't, you know? So he's like, I got the okay from God. It's just that that inner peace, you know, peace that passes understanding. That's my okay. I know when I have that feeling, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. If I don't have that feeling, I stop. But I'm like, Lord, what's going on? You know? I talk to him like I talk to you all. Sometimes he answers me. Sometimes I just sort of know. Sometimes he makes me hunt for something. That's just the way he works. And um, sure enough, I walk over the parking lot. His place, his office is down near Albertsons, if you know where that's at, near the bright pink pig. I think it's a liquor store. I don't try not to frequent liquor stores. <laughs> Growing up in three generations of alcoholic family, I was like, Lord, you said you stopped this between the third and fourth. I'm the fourth. Stop it now. I don't want to go there. You know? And he's been very gracious, and he did. I do have a little bit now and then, but I do it for communion. I do it at parties, birthday parties, not drunk parties, you know, stuff like that. Maybe three times in a year, I'll have a glass of wine other than communion. And um, by the time I get to my friends across the other side of the Albertsons parking lot where she was at, I'm feeling fabulous. I mean, just steadily improving. My body is like, I've got a bounce in my step. I haven't had bounce in my step for like 10 years, people. You know, now I've got a bounce in my steps. I meet up with my friend. She's walking her little dog. We walk all the way around the parking lot. I'm not short of breath. I'm not in pain. I'm walking like I'm 20 years old again. I'm like, this is awesome. I ended up checking my watch. I walked three miles that day nonstop, played tag with the dog and a couple other little things. Didn't feel any pain. Didn't have any shortness of breath. God gave me the miracle we prayed for. Thank you, Dustin, for praying with me. Thank you for everybody who has helped out with that. And if you haven't, I wanted to share it with all of you because you're my family here. You are my family here on earth. And God really does work. And I am an awesome, well, I don't know about me, but he is an awesome example and use me as an awesome example for you guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you for your wisdom. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> yes that's awesome what a god is so good Amen. all the time that's right so we are in uh, part 15 of our study in the synoptic gospels in the chronological gospels 
So what we're going to do is I keep dialing this in. Maybe one of these days I'll get this down and it'll be smooth. So we'll see how today works. <laughs> so we're going to start in Matthew 12, verses uh, 1 this morning. <clears throat> then Mark 2 and Luke 6. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples became hungry and began to pick the heads of grain and eat. And Mark says, and it happened that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. And then Luke says, now it happened that he was passing through some grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were picking the heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands, and eating the grain. Now the disciples, they were doing what was allowed by God. And we see this in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 23, 25, it says, When you enter your neighbor's standing grain, then you may pluck the heads with your hand, but you shall not wield a sickle in your neighbor's standing grain. This is a testament of how the disciples and Jesus were in need, how they traveled a lot, how they were away from their home base of operations a lot. And so they kind of depended on other people to feed them to, like in this case, where they were walking through the grain field, and they were feeding themselves with the grain. They Have you ever been so hungry that you, you went into a wheat field, the neighbor's wheat field, and started plucking the grain out and blowing it and and then eating it. Have you been that hungry? Cornfield, yes. <laughs> or the cornfield? I've personally, not, I've done that. Made uh, wheat gum, you know, but <laughs> I've never, never did it because I was so hungry. I'm starving and I need some sustenance. But these guys were. So they didn't have an easy life with Jesus. When he says, take up your cross and follow me, then the cross is a, a burden that we bear, and it's a painful at times, and it's not easy, and it's not uh, a bed of roses. But the results in the end is worth it all. <laughs> so they they would uh, they would do this, and the disciples they weren't doing anything wrong. Now notice that it said that they did this on the Sabbath. Now the Pharisees. The religious leaders, they're going to freak out. You're going to see that here in just a second. So in Matthew 12, 2, it says, But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Oh, go figure. They would, they would have some, something to say about that. The Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And then Luke says, but some of the Pharisees says, why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Not lawful according to whom? The spiritual Karens of the day. Spiritual Karens, I like that. <laughs> the spiritual Karens of the day, which are the Pharisees. Who are the spiritual Karens of today? Anybody who is religious, that's who the spiritual Karens are. If your religion gets in the way with a relationship <laughs> with God, then you are a spiritual Karen or a Pharisee. The law did not prevent one from eating on the Sabbath, okay? They did not prevent one from walking through a grain field and eating the grain on the Sabbath. But the religious leaders in the oral law, the, the Talmud, they, they, they added to God's law. And so when we add to God's law, then we get ourselves in trouble. Because what, what did Moses do? When he added to God's command to him, he said, speak to this rock and it will bring forth water. And what he do? He tells the, the Israelites, you guys, you want me to strike this rock again? And he struck the rock three times and it or twice and it poured forth water. And God says, well, for that. Son, you're not going into the promised land. Oh, God, why, please? No, because you misrepresented me. I wasn't angry at the people. You were angry at the people. And you you, you pro uh, projected your anger on the people as if it was my anger towards the people. And we misrepresent God when we add to his laws. When we add to his word so that it... 
uh, if I'm convicted of something and I stop doing something because I'm convicted of it, that's fine because God's dealing with me. If it's one of them things that the Bible doesn't say that you have to not do this. The Bible doesn't tell you you can't smoke. Okay. If I, if I quit smoking, it's because God has convicted me. If God doesn't convict you of that, then hey, by all means, that's between you and God. I, if I sit there and say, if you smoke, you're going to hell, then I am now adding to him and I'm, I'm uh, projecting what God has dealt with me to you. And that's wrong. That's religion. And that's not what we're supposed to do. And I just use smoking because it's just because it's really not in the Bible. But alcohol is. Um, God says I shouldn't drink. Do I tell you you can't drink? No. What's the Bible say? The Bible says don't drink in an excess. But if God is dealing with you personally to not drink, then that is sin for you if you do. Okay. But if he's not, then you know what? Don't drink in excess. Some people are not allowed to drink one drink because they're alcoholics. But God can deliver us from alcoholism. See, the AA has got this all wrong. They say when you're an alcoholic, you're an alcoholic for life. But they're missing one thing because their higher power isn't the same higher power as my higher power. My higher power can deliver us from that. See, my higher power is the God of the universe. And that God of the universe can say, I deliver you from this. You, you're no longer an alcoholic. <laughs> alcoholic is something that people that drink a lot of alcohol and they can't stop. It. That's what they are. But if he delivers me from that and I don't touch another drop in my lifetime, I'm no longer an alcoholic because I'm delivered. Right? So we're sinners. And we're saved by grace. Okay. When he saves us, we will still sin. But I'm no longer defined by that sin. What am I now? I am now a Christ follower. I am now a Christian. I am defined by who I serve. And that's God. And he is my boss. So I'm no longer this sinful man that I once was. Now, I may, I do, I, we all will, on this side of glory, we will sin. But we are delivered from the, the, the wages of that sin as far as the death, the eternal death. In Matthew 12, 3, it says, but he said to them, have you not read what David did when he became hungry, he and his companions? How he entered the house of God and they ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those with him, but for the priests alone. And then Mark says, and he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in the need or was in need and he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests. And he also gave it to those who were with him. And then Luke says, and Jesus answered them saying, have you not even read what David did when he was hungry? <coughs> he and those who were with him how he entered the house of God and took and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for any to eat except the priests alone, and gave it to his companions. For one, this was a jeer at them, right? At the religious leaders. He's like, have you not read? See, they're, they, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, they are, are so prideful that they know the word of God and and they know the Hebrew and they can read the Hebrew and the Greek and they they know all this stuff and Jesus is like haven't you read didn't you know that David when he went into the temple and he ate the bread that that was forbidden by the law 
But there's exceptions to the law. If it mean if it means somebody needs sustenance, then God will say it's okay. Because he says here in a little bit, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. <clears throat> not only did Jesus accuse them of not reading the scriptures, he accused them of being ignorant of what the scriptures are saying. So you may know the Bible, you may be able to quote line and verse, but if you don't understand what it's telling you, you're no better than the Pharisees. You may be able to quote these things, but if it's not in here, if it's not in your heart, then it's just a bunch of words for you. And I've come across those people. They they appear to be religious or they appear to be godly because they know the Bible. And you may walk away and say, yeah, that guy really knows his Bible. But does he really know the Bible? Is he living the Bible? Is he really believing what he's reading? You can know it and not believe it. You can know it and not live it. You're no better than the Pharisees. You're just a religious schmuck that doesn't doesn't do what the Bible tells you to do. Exactly. The devil knows the Bible. He knows it very well. But it's not going to help. <laughs> I'm going to drink this. Do you need a water? I'm good. Thank you. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? You have never thought of that. The in Matthew twelve five. See the priests, in order to do what they need to do for the the Israelites, they had to work. And being a priest in the temple was hard work. Have you ever butchered an animal? We did when I was growing up. We butchered our own beef and our own pork, and I helped when I was a kid. So what we would do is we would kill the animal one weekend. We would kill, we would skin, we'd gut, we'd quarter, and hang them in the Quonset. And this is all in the wintertime because we hung them in a Quonset that didn't have air conditioning or a freezer or anything like that. So we needed the temperature outside to be freezing. So it's cold. We're skinning this animal out there in the cold. We we had an old farm hand. We hung the animal outside the or hung him up by their front legs so that we can dump the guts in the back of the truck and take it out to the pasture and dump them. But then we'd skin them out and then we'd quarter them and hang them. We had meat hooks, we had saw, we had meat grinder, we had all the stuff that you need and sharp knives, a lot of sharp knives. And we had these big spools that you see the, the wire on that they you see out on the um, on the side of the roads where they unroll the wires for like the the cables that they bury. We had these big spools and we'd put wrapping paper, meat wrapping paper on them. And that's what we used to cut the meat on. So the one, the first weekend we would kill the animal and hang it. We'd usually do two or three cows or bats at one time or one or two hogs at one time. And so the, then all week they would hang and freeze and age. The next weekend, we would start cutting that up. Now we had five-gallon buckets of hot water because after you cut frozen meat for a while, your hands are so stinking cold. You can't feel them anymore. You whack a finger off, you know. So <coughs> that's hard work. <laughs> that is not for the faint of heart. And uh, so these priests, they would do this. They butchered for God. Uh, some of the organs and stuff they would burn on the altar, and some of the some depending on on what the offering was, they would either burn the whole thing or they would burn part of it. But the rest of it and some of it they would boil. But God loves a good barbecue. <laughs> Remember, He says the the sweet smelling aroma. Have you ever been around a smoke pit or a barbecue pit and that sweet smelling aroma? God loves that. You know, we're, we're going to be eating good in heaven because God loves barbecue and I do too. So, so they would barbecue every single day. And the, the priest, that was their food. 
And sometimes some of the some of the offerings the the people would eat along with. Um, and then like the Passover, once a year, they would eat this lamb and they would eat the whole thing all night long. There's a, there's a feast, an all night feast. They would eat until they couldn't eat no more. <coughs> <coughs> then come morning, they would burn what was left. Because remember the morning of after the Passover in Egypt, they had to leave in a hurry. And they, so they didn't even wait for their bread to rise. They took this unleavened bread and they they took off. Because they had to get out of Egypt. And so that's hard work. And so the priests, they didn't get that Sabbath day off. Now, granted, I'm sure God allowed for them to have another day off. And so, but they weren't breaking the Sabbath because they had to work. In Matthew 12, 6, <clears throat> hold on. Help me with this cold. Rid of it. Okay, but I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not a sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. You see, these religious leaders are condemning the innocent. What God calls innocent, who are we to say they're condemned, right? God is the judge. For condemnation. When the when we read the passage, it says, condemn not lest or judge not lest you be judged. Get the speck out of your own eye, or get before you ask to get the brother, the speck out of your brother's eye, get the plank out of your own eye. That word there for judge not is condemn not. We're not to condemn one another because only God can do that. God will condemn. Now we are to judge one another. Righteous judgment is what we are supposed to do. If you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing, it is my job to confront you. If I'm doing something I'm not supposed to be doing, it is your job to confront me. And that, <laughs> the, the, uh, the non-believers, they'll say, well, you shouldn't judge me. No, you, you shouldn't do what you're doing. But they can't help it either because they don't have Christ. We are supposed to help it. We're supposed to <coughs> we're supposed to live right. <clears throat> but these religious leaders, they condemn the disciples for plucking the grain and harvesting and winnowing and and blowing off the chaff so they were they were um, processing the grain. And so that was all work. Well, <laughs> In Israel today, the, there is elevators that hit every floor as they go up and every floor as they go down. Because if you push that button, that's work. And you're, or you can't turn a light on because that's igniting a fire and you're not supposed to do that. They are so ridiculous. It is so ridiculous. They missed the whole point. <laughs> Excuse me. So remember last week, we saw this same thing. In Matthew 9, 13, it says, but go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And so he says, go learn this, because this week he expects them to know it, and they still don't get it. He, he desires... <coughs> compassion not sacrifice jesus over and over is trying to demonstrate to the religious leaders that compassion is better and more important than religion compassion over religion where religion gets stronger the compassion for the people gets weaker and we've all seen that if you've ever been involved in a church that is just preaching religion that is involved in a denomination or a a, a place of worship that all they care about is their religious practices and their 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 uh, man's attempt to get to God is all religion is. And so when you try to do that, then you lose the compassion. 
They were so religious, they had no compassion left. Let us not ever be that way. And it's, you know, the, the denomination churches, they started out right because they were breaking away from a non-compassionate religious hierarchy. And that was the Catholic Church. See, the Catholic Church, they started out right too in the beginning. But then they kind of got farther away from God and and the 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 um, <coughs> religion started to build up, and they started to the um, what do we call that? They married the pagan church. Well, um, when we uh, when we practice um, traditions, that's what I was, I was yeah, trying to find that word. <laughs> so traditions of man. In time, you put religious to it, religion things to that, and it becomes religious to you. Okay, so we broke away from that in the Reformation. And the Reformation was a revival for the church, the true church. And then all of a sudden, well, not all of a sudden, but in time, as time went by, the, the denomination started doing exactly what they broke away from. They started looking more and more like what they broke away from. And that's the traditions of man. They became religious. And so now they're judgy. And they're, they, if you don't do this, you do that, you're doing wrong, you're whatever. It, it's all about man's practices instead of a relationship with God. And then you got these churches that break away from denominations. And they're saying, oh, we're a non-denominational church. And so they, but the farther away from they get, from that, now they're starting to do it exactly what the denomination churches did. It's our nature to put rules on things. And so then you have the cowboy church, and we broke away from the non-denominational churches. We call ourselves the cowboy church. I get a preach in a cowboy hat, and it's wonderful. And I wish we had a, a, a an arena that we could call ours, and we, we're working on that. But But if we're not careful... We will do the exact same things that everybody else doesn't like about church. Okay? I just can't speak very well. So <laughs> that's always going to be the same. Okay? I'm not uh, uh, this scholar. and what it, it doesn't matter. But you know what? We have a relationship with God. And that is my goal is for us to always have this relationship with God. Let it be that we can have a relationship with God and not have a bunch of rules and doctrines that are of man. So in the next slide here, in Matthew 12, 8, it says, For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. <clears throat> So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And then Luke says, and he was saying to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. But I like how in, in Mark it says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. This, let me say that again. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. We weren't created so that we could follow a bunch of rules. The rules were created so that we could look to God. The law was given to us so that we would know that we are sinners and we need a savior. The Sabbath was given to us so that we would be forced to rest because God knows that we need to rest. If we don't, we burn out. If we don't rest, we will kill ourselves. God did not rest on the seventh day because he was tired. He rested on the seventh day from his creation. That means he stopped doing the creating. And he says, I'm going to do this. I rested. So this is an example to you so that you will rest. And it doesn't matter what day we rest. If we, if we rest on Sunday instead of Saturday, that's not the mark of the beast like some religions say. Okay? That's not, it doesn't matter what day. We, we, we get together on Sunday because it's the day the Lord raised from the dead. We celebrate that when we do communion. We celebrate that every time we meet together. But we can rest any day of the week. We can take a Sabbath. But I'll tell you what. I guarantee you there's not a single person in this world that can actually 
do what the Sabbath rest does. You will break that Sabbath one way or the other. So that's not what we're supposed to do. The Sabbath was made for us so that we would rest. So we need to take a day of rest, one day a week. Now, in this country, we're a bunch of lazy bums, and we usually take two days. Okay? <laughs> but God didn't say that. He said, take one day. Six days you shall work, and on the seventh you shall rest. <coughs> <coughs> that was for us. We'll understand one day when we get to heaven that, hey, you idiot. <laughs> if you just rested a little more, maybe you'd have lived longer, had a, a little less problems in your life. If if we do what God says to do in the law, if we do what God says to do in his word, it just makes our life a little better here on this earth. Okay, we sometimes we make our lives a little harder than what we need to because we disobey him. There's something called consequences for sin. There's and it's natural consequences. If you jump off a seven-story building, there's a something called the natural law of gravity, and you will splat when you hit the ground. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Some people may have a heart attack on the way down, but but <laughs> <clears throat> there's certain things that uh, can overcome gravity, though, and that's the law of lift. Okay, that's another law. It counteracts gravity. Well, there's laws of sin and death. If you sin, you die. If you do this thing, then it's going to hurt you here. And he tells us all that. And if we just would listen, half the problems we have in our life would go away. If if I would do some, uh, if I would take care of things in my life, then I wouldn't have some of the problems I have in my life. And we are all the same way. You know, if we just if we just do what God wants us to do and we do his perfect will each and every day, then our lives might just be a little better. So with that, we're going to close for today. Next week, we'll go into Matthew 12, 9 through 21, Mark 3, 1 through 12, and Luke 6, 6 through 11. Now, this is your homework assignment. Read those and read them several days this next week. That way, when I'm covering it, you're not lost. You can follow right along with me because you've already read it. You already know what it says. And then maybe we can, if we do this, then... Uh, it, we might actually get more out of it. So write this down. Matthew chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. And Luke 6, 6 through 11. So read. Those three passages every day this week. Try it. Just no jumping around. Trust me. <laughs> Test me on this. No jumping around. Do you need those verses again? No. We, we I got, got them. We got them you got them? You want them one more time? <laughs> Matthew 12, 9 through 21. Mark 3, 1 through 12. And Luke 6, 6 through 11. I'll put these back here. You can just... Write them down if you missed it. I'm going to set these right on the table over here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you've given us your word. Father, we pray that you help us not to be religious, but to be compassionate with one another, compassionate with the world, and, and share the gospel, the good news. We're running out of time, Lord. As we see what we're studying on Wednesdays, as we see these things happening and in the world today, we know that time is short and we only have this amount of time while we're still on this earth to share the gospel, to share your love with other people. <coughs> we don't know if we're going to be able to wake up tomorrow or not. We don't know if 
something's going to happen to this country or <laughs> if we're just going to die in our sleep or if you come for us at any moment, we're done. That's it. So we pray that that you help us to, to see who we need to talk to, to, to grease the skids for those that need to hear our hear what we have to say. Lord, we just pray that your word would reach the nations out there, that your word would reach this city, and that we might be your mouthpiece, Lord. And Lord, bless you and keep you, and the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. And Wednesday. Wednesday. Whoops. Wednesday at 6.30, we're going to show a video. And then the following Wednesday after that, we're going to talk about the one world economy, one world money system. And so, but this, this coming up Wednesday, we're going to, we're going to show the video if I can get it. Um, uh, Jesus Revolution. And we're going to play it up here. I got it. If you can hook up my iPad. I can do that. Okay. I'll download it this week and then I'll play with it. Perfect. I can, I sh should be able to. Should be able to. If you have it downloaded, I can do it wirelessly on, on this too. Yeah, that's why I said I have it downloaded. That way it'll be going to option. Perfect. Yeah, that'll work. Are we doing so, a dinner still too or something? Um, Michael and I, are we going to do some food and yes. snacks yeah. and stuff? And some food. If you need help, so let me know some of the things you need. Yeah, and if you want to bring some food or or something for Wednesday, then get with Michael Ann, coordinate with her, and she would be more than happy to have you help with food. So God bless you, and have a good week. Huh?